You're listening to Hebrews Jesus is Better series, preached by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Let's pray. Lord, we come rejoicing this morning that your wounds have paid our ransom, that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have eternal life through the Son, through his sacrifice, his death, his burial, and resurrection. And so we praise you for that. Lord, I thank you for this time of the year. Hearts and minds are geared at least toward the name Christmas. And I pray that we as your people would again glory in the fact of your incarnation, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I pray that we would understand the glorious truth of what that means for all of us this morning. And for those who don't know you, Lord, I pray that today would be the day that their eyes would be open to the truth of this glorious gospel. Spirit of God, I'm fully aware that in my own words and strength and power, there is nothing that can be done of any eternal value or worth. And so, Spirit of God, I pray that you would guide and direct, that you would empower, that you would speak and use the message this morning. Use what's been said already through the Sunday school, the special the hymns that were sung, the scriptures that were read, all to exalt and lift up Jesus Christ. That is your job, and we thank you for it. And so, Lord, I pray now for freedom and for just clarity of thought as we go through this text in Hebrews. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter 2, um, I am not one to speak on special events. If you've been here for any length of time, we usually go through a book of the Bible, and as we go through the Bible, wherever we land, we land, and that's about it. There are occasions that are different, of course, for Easter and Christmas, but I've never been one to do an Advent kind of series, which I don't think is a bad idea, that you work your way to the the coming of Christmas Day. The truth is, I already think next year I might do that. But I'm so thrilled that God, in his providence and care, knowing that I would not think about these things at all. We land this morning at a text that is perfect for this time of the year. It's amazing, actually, when I think about it. And so excited. Listen to the text this morning in Hebrews chapter 2. We'll start at verse 5. But I want you to know that this this little portion um, from 5 to 9 is really a transitional piece in in this text, because we've been talking now about the glory of Jesus Christ and who he is, the author, again, talking to people who are ready to quit, who are discouraged, who want to turn back now. Life is hard, life is difficult, and they think maybe it's just not worth it. And what he knows is that to the clarity in which we see Jesus Christ and what he has done with us is how we will endure It is proportionate to how we endure. When we see Christ for who he is, who he truly is, not who we think he is or what we say he is, but who he is, we then can endure. And so in chapter 1, verses 5 through 14, we have Christ being superior to angels. And he's superior in the fact that he's been given a title, Son. Right? No one else is called Son. The Son of God, Jesus Christ. But not only was he given the title Son, It also says that the angels who are beyond our imagination or belief in power and glory and majesty, they serve him. They do his bidding. Why? Because he's the creator and he created them. And finally, the writer tells us in chapter 1 that he is superior because he is the sovereign Lord and the king of the universe. And so, with that in mind, we end chapter 1. Chapter 2 then begins with a warning that we should not drift away. Because if we sin against this love and this grace, we're in trouble. And that drifting happens without us even knowing sometimes. So he calls us back to that. So he talked about Christ being superior to the angels. And now what he does is amazing. He takes a portion from Psalm 8, which was just read this morning. And he sticks it in this this area just before he tells us about the incarnation. And so we're going to go from the glory of Jesus Christ, high, exalted, and lifted up, now to see that he was made lower than the angels. 
And of course, as we think of being made lower than the angels, we naturally go to the incarnation, which we'll talk about later, not today. But it's a perfect spot for this text. He was made lower than the angels. And so, look with me, if you would, in chapter 2, verse number 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou made him a little lower than the angels. Thou crowned him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection unto, under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So, the writer tells us as far as Christ is superior to the angels in every way that we can fathom and imagine. For a time, he became lower than the angels. And what I find amazing, as, as this pastor is trying to encourage his people, as he's interpreting the Old Testament, what he's telling us is that Psalm 8, speaking of mankind in general, finds its ultimate fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about here. And so we're going to look now at this idea of Jesus, God, the second person of the Trinity, being made a little lower than the angels. Our minds naturally go to Bethlehem. And what we think of in Bethlehem is the birth of a baby. There was a song written a number of years ago and was talking about this very fact about the anticipation of a baby and a child being born. Not a child, the anticipation of Messiah being born. The Jews looking for a savior and a deliverer. And the song goes something like this, follow the star to a place unexpected. Would you believe after all we projected, after everything we thought the Messiah would be, a child in the manger, lowly and small, the weakest of all, unlikeliest hero wrapped in his mother's shawl. Is this who we waited for? And the fact is, it is mind-blowing that the promise of the Messiah, all the projection on what was coming, they had no clue that this would be the beginning, that Christ would be made lower than the angels. And how does the God of heaven come to sinful mankind? He comes as a baby. Listen, there is nothing intimidating about a baby. And for men, it's like, yeah, they cry and they mess their diaper. I get it. But really, it's not that terrifying. The truth is, and maybe this is an age thing, but the older I get, um, the more I love babies. I do, I love babies. And I really love, goes without saying, my grandbabies, right? And, and we have them, and I have to tell you, even when they cry, they don't strike fear into my heart. They're babies. Hey, I'm 51. I don't have to sleep at night. I'm okay, right? I'm okay. I can deal with this. I'm going to send them home eventually. It's okay. And they're cute, and they're plump. I mean, really plump. Um, I was thinking about telling a story this morning because Kim's not here. Should I? Okay. All right. So um, now you guys are bad. Can we get this? This is going to be etched from. Okay. Yeah, thank you. This will be taken out. So it won't be. You'll find it there, and she'll get, I'll get in trouble. It's okay. Um, so we we were so excited this last year. Of course, we had five granddaughters in five months. It's like, oh my goodness, this is fantastic. And, and Addie was born, and just a little pea, just tiny. She, she never got, like, 
I wouldn't say fat, but that's not what I was going to say. I was going to say healthy. Um, but she was just tiny. And then we have the two other ones, L and Ren, and they're healthy. They're really healthy. And so, and so, and so really excited about the whole experience. You know, you hear the people tell the stories about, oh, wait till you have grandchildren. And before you have them, you think all those people are crazy. Like, yeah, 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 your kid's ugly. Don't want to see more pictures of that grandchild of yours. And, but something happens, like weird happens. The first time that kid is born, your heart is gone. It, it's just gone. And you love them more than you could ever imagine. You, and I know, parents, I know, I know you don't get it, but I'm telling you something. It's like, I love them more than my own kids. I just, I do. Greg and Becca, so what? Andy, Katie, who cares? Agent, that doesn't matter. The babies, right? So we were just so excited about this. And so, I mean, you can't even express the excitement. You, you just can't. You want to explode. And so the last two girls were born, and Kim was getting her hair cut, and I I went in to pick her up. She was done, and she was just so excited, so just talking about the babies and trying to express all that she could about the glories of these little girls. And, and I walked in, and as I walked in, she was explaining this, and someone must have asked the question, well, what do you think about all this? And she said these words. She said, they're just so, and I could tell she was searching, and she said, Delicious. And I looked, I was like, delicious. Are you a cannibal woman? A delicious. But the weird thing was, I got it. I, I knew, yeah, they're delicious, right? They're just wonderful. And so here is the God of heaven who, who sends us sinful men and women. A baby. A baby. We couldn't have expected it that the word will become flesh and dwell among us and be born in Bethlehem, the house of bread, where we would then experience the bread of life. The incarnation is mind-blowing that this second person of the triune God is made lower than the angels. There are a lot of lessons we can learn from just that thought about Bethlehem, that God came down and stepped into our world, that he was made a little lower than the angels. But there are several I want to talk about this morning as we sort of just move away from the text for just a second to think about being made lower, and then we'll go back to the text at the end. But being made lower than the angels teaches us a great lesson about peace. There is no peace today. There's not. I, I know that we live in a country right now where there's peace. But you know since 1968, there's not been one year free from war in this world. Not one. And we are isolated and insulated, and we, we don't think much about it. We don't think about young men and women in their teens or younger losing their lives. Right? Battle and conflict. But the truth is, in our lives, there is very little peace. With all that we have, the stuff that we enjoy, the things we do, we are in a world without peace. And here's what happens. God, who is holy, righteous, and just, when he looks at mankind, could have just said, listen, I'm done with a lot of you. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. I was listening to a song Sunday morning, two or three weeks back. And the song is a psalm about Psalm 46. And it says, the God who knows the hearts of men, and still you let them live. And God could have said, I'm done with you. But being made lower than the angels, it shouts to us peace. It tells us that the God of heaven does not want to destroy us. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. None. This being made lower the, than the angels is him saying, listen, this is my olive branch to you. I am speaking peace to you. Through a baby, there is a way back to me to be reconciled. It shouts to us, peace. Is that not what the angels said on their great announcement? 
Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, peace. As we think of him being made lower than the angels this morning, we ought to think about peace in our own hearts and lives. I'm sure you've seen that billboard or maybe a meme that says, no peace, N-O, no peace, no God, no peace, right? And then it changes, no, K-N-O-W, no God, and then no peace. Through him being made lower than the angels this morning, you can know peace. My friend, if you're without Christ, you can know the peace of God. And believer, listen to me. Wherever you find yourself this morning, whatever the situation, you can know peace. He was made lower than the angels. It shouts peace. It shouts something else. It shouts love. Being made lower than the angels shouts love to us because Bethlehem, we just can't leave Bethlehem alone. It's associated with Jerusalem. The cradle must meet the cross. That, that's what it's all about. That these tender hands would be torn. That these little feet that had not yet touched the earth one day would be nailed to a tree. That his side would be pierced by a Roman spear. That his back would be scourged to where it looked like a farmer's field. That his cheeks would be bitten, be, beaten and his face would be spit upon. That a crown of thorns would be placed on this child, soon to be a man's head. He would be beaten with rods. Why? You see, the world wants to stay in Bethlehem. You can't stay in Bethlehem because the baby grew up. And he faced the cross of Calvary. Why? Why would he do that? And you need to get this, too. Some of you folks, you really think that, well, I'll just do my best, and I'll go to church, and I'll be religious, and I'll, and I'll join a church, and I'll do good things, and that's going to cover everything. Well, then you have to ask, what in the world did Christ die for? He died because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We sing a song around here that I, I thoroughly love. It's a, it's a song called, Here is Love Vast as the Ocean. And it's from the old Welsh revivals. It's an amazing song. All the stanzas. But one stanza says this. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains opened deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above. Heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world with love. When he was made lower than the angels, it shouts to us the fact that here is a God who loved us so much that he sent his son to die for our sins. Our sins. My friend, listen to me. If you do not know this Jesus, today is the day to accept him. Today is the day to say, I'm done trusting my own self, my own goodness, my own works, my own religion, my own ways, my own thoughts. I'm going to repent and turn to Christ. Accept him today. Today is the day of salvation. You are not guaranteed another breath. We really, we think we're going to live forever. We never think about death. And then we're surprised when it happens to people. Accept him. And for those of us who know him, proclaim him. What are we doing? Honestly, what are we doing? We have a season of the year now that the world is looking to, at least, they know Christ is in Christmas. I mean, right? Maybe they don't understand it, but the world looks there. And we, as his people, have the perfect opportunity to share this hope. And we're happy that we're saved. And okay that no one else is. He became lower than the angels, was made lower than the angels, shouts love to us, receive it, and proclaim it. Proclaim it. It's the greatest story ever told. There's a third thing that him being made lower than the angels tells us. It is his humility. This one who is higher than the angels, this one who they serve him, this one who is the sovereign king, was humble. The highest became the lowest. The creator sleeps 
in a woman's arms. The ancient of days becomes the infant of days. You know, I was thinking about his humility. And it's, it's, not, just, it's not just God takes on flesh, which is mind-blowing, right? We, would, we can't even grasp it if we thought, what if I knew everything I knew right now and it was stuck in a baby's body? It would be terrible. Terrible. Someone else taking care of you, feeding you, changing you. Some of you, you're getting there, but I mean, it'd be terrible. Be terrible. We can't fathom. But, but can I tell you something about Jesus? Not only did he humble himself, taking upon flesh, being made Lord of the angels, but the way he did it, he was born among the smell of livestock and manure. Right? We talk about being born on the wrong sides of the track. That would qualify. Right? This is our Savior. He relates to real people. Like real people. Not fake people, but people who have no concept, but real people. And, and not only that, do you, do you understand? As he's born to Mary and Joseph, right? He has a human body. And you would think, here's what I would think the Son of God. Certainly he should look like Thor. Right? I mean, Thor, or for your older generation, Fabio. I don't know. I don't even know if you know who that is. The butter guy. Anyways. But, 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 but don't you think that at least he should... Do you know what the Bible tells us? He had no form or comeliness. He had no majesty or beauty. You would see him as a teenager, a gangly, awkward teenager, with B.O. and bad breath. By the way, teenagers take a bath, use deodorant. We have, we're in a different world now, okay? But, but this is, but the savior of the world, a gangly teenager, awkward. And then he has no majesty, no beauty. You would look into the streets, and what you would see is not Thor. You would see a short, probably five foot five. Dave's not here this morning. Um, a five foot five Jewish man who the Bible says there was nothing attractive about him. You wouldn't say, oh, that's got to be, that's got to be the guy. Look, look what he looks like. You would never say that. And this is our God, the humility of Jesus Christ. My friend, this is the most incredible, outrageous story ever, and yet it is the most credible and true story ever. Amen? It is. And this is our God. He humbles himself. No wonder that when God looks for men and women to use, he never picks out the arrogant, self-righteous, or haughty. But this is what he says. The one who inhabits eternity. The one who the earth is his footstool. Heaven is his throne. He looks to the man and the woman, men and women, who are humble and tremble at his word. Well, don't you know who I am? Yes, I do. You're a sinner. Made of dust. That worms one day will eat your body. And after you die, they're going to go to the funeral and eat egg salad sandwiches, and no one's going to care. Right? We're going to go have lunch. Right? That's what we do. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're clay. We're dust. We're broken. And the difference is, you can be a sinner saved by grace, or you can be a sinner lost without Christ. We should be humble. Our Savior came to serve and give his life. And Christian, you cannot be happy until you serve and give your life. God has placed you somewhere this morning. Every one of us, you are somewhere. He's put you in that home, um, in that marriage, in your singleness, in, at the university, um, in that job place, in your neighborhood. He, he has put you there. And it is there where you need to be planted and go serve. Give your life. Humble yourself. Oh, that's, that's below me. There is nothing below a servant or a slave. If Christ washed the feet of his disciples, you can't serve him? He was humble. 
And there's one more thing that, that this being made lower of the angels just cries out, shouts to me anyways. It's self-denial. From the cradle to the cross, Jesus Christ never lived for himself. Ever. When he was hungry after 40 days, he doesn't make a sandwich for himself. Sandwich. He doesn't. But when 5,000 men, women and children, and over 5,000 5, men plus women and children are hungry and famished and ready to faint like sheep without a shepherd, he provides completely for them. Never thinking about himself. He served the one who betrayed him. You're going to see that picture. Disciples are there. Judas is there. Jesus Christ is washing his feet. He healed the one who arrested him. Peter was really either bad with the sword or just a little anxious. It just caught the guy's ear, right? Maybe he was swinging for the head. Maybe he didn't know what he's doing. Jesus heals the servant. And he loved the world that crucified him. My friend, we need to take some time this morning and this season and our entire life to think about what Hebrews is telling us. The one who was superior to all was the one who was made lower than the angels. It shouts out peace. It shouts out love. It shouts out humility. And it shouts out the idea that he gave completely of himself. Now, back in our text in Hebrews chapter 2. We see he was made lower than the angels. And we, we know we're headed toward the incarnation. But the writer's not done yet there. There's more to be found. Um, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 8, it says, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. And again, this is the ultimate ultimate fulfillment of Christ. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not under him. So we go from this idea of being made lower, the incarnation, his suffering, his death, but we don't stop there. That, that's not Advent. Well, that is. He came the first time, but it doesn't stop there. The writer goes on to remind us of this fact that there is coming a day when he, well, he was through the resurrection, but even more so, that he will be exalted above everything and everyone. We go from being made lower to the incarnation. Now he talks about his exaltation. He says he's left nothing unsubmitted. Now, we know that right now it doesn't look as if everything's under his feet. Right now, it doesn't seem as Everything's under his control. And right now, it seems as if the world is just insane without rhyme or reason. But here's what the writer tells us. Because Christ was made lower than the angels, because he suffered, he has now been exalted. And it might not be yet, but there is coming a day when everything will be under his feet. Advent, the first one, is just the beginning. There's a second coming of our King and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we need to look to that. Don't just stop at being made lower. He has been exalted. And because of that, there is hope. There is hope. That there is coming a day when every enemy will be under his feet. He will crush them. And even our enemy, the greatest enemy of death, someday will be under his feet. And there are times in our lives when we just don't believe it or we don't see it. I know this morning there are people here who right now, you are struggling. Right now, you are hurting. Right now, it might seem hopeless. Right now, you don't know what's coming or you do know what's coming. Right now, you're suffering pain and grief and hopelessness. And I understand it and God understands it. But I want you to know that there is coming a day when Jesus Christ will make all things right. All of it. And so we glory in the fact that he was made lower than the angels. But my friend, we must look forward to when he comes again because he will be exalted above all things. Listen to the writer of Revelation, John, and what he sees. He says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, 
the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Death has failed to be found equal to the life of Christ. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are past. And my friend, this is the truth of Jesus Christ, who for a time was made lower than the angels. A time. But now because of his life, his death, his resurrection, he has been exalted. And that's the fact, that he will rule and reign and make all things right. It is futuristic. We understand that. We get great hope and confidence knowing that that is the truth of the matter, that this same Jesus will come again and rule and reign. So this morning, believer, how does the idea of him being made lower than the angels with peace, humility, love, self-denial, how does that jive with you? I mean, does your life match up to those things? Are, are we anything like our Savior who became lower than the angels for our sake? We need to examine ourselves this morning. Too many of us, we live haphazardly in our lives. We never stop. We never think. We show up on church week after week after week and never really examine what's happening in our lives. We have trouble. We have struggles. We have difficulties. But we never stop and say, okay, wait a minute, Jesus. What is it that you have done for me? What example have you given me? What tools do I have through your spirit, your word, and the body of Christ to see you completely transform me? And then this morning, if you're here, I beg you, listen, don't let this holiday season pass you by thinking that you're okay if you don't know Christ. Today is a day of salvation. And this one who died for you rose again and is coming again. And when he comes, he will never again be mocked. He will never again be sneered, spit upon, marginalized again. And every knee will bow. And I would encourage you this morning, bow the knee now. Bow the knee now. Repent and turn to Christ. Today is a day of salvation. You can know the Savior who became lower than the angels for a time to redeem sons and daughters to God. But now he's exalted. And there's coming a day, even so come Lord Jesus, when he will make all things right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you for this text and how we see the, the beauty and the intricacy of your word, how it, it interprets itself for us. We see the ultimate fulfillment of Psalm 8 in the person of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you. The Son was willing to be made lower than the angels. That you shout out to us peace and humility, and love, self-denial. Lord, help us to come in line with who you are. As your people, Lord, help us to think about what we're living for and why we're here and what our purpose is. Help us to see Christ for who he is. Lord, help us to follow him. Lord, this morning, if there's one here without you, I pray that today they would see clearly it's not in their works, it's not in their religion, it's not in anything but Jesus and Jesus alone. So, Father, bless now this time of reflection and song. With hearts truly being stirred, life's being made right. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.